Are we live? Can you guys hear us? Yes. All right. So, hi there, Empire State Maker Fair. Uh, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm D.B. Lantman. And I'm Scott Van Campen at uh, Makerspace NYC. Right. Um, we're happy to be here today. Um, we're coming off of three events today um, and a full day of makerspace at both of our locations. So we're we're a little we're a little tired. It's been a long day. <laughs> um, and some technical difficulties, of course. But we're here and we're happy to be here. Um, and uh, you know, it's been a little bit crazy because we've been uh, with COVID and everything and trying to get uh, back in the swing of things. Seems like nothing's been going on except then today we had, we just had to pack it all into one day. So right. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, we have, um, we are Makerspace NYC. We are in New York City. Um, we are, uh, we have two locations. We um, are, we are sitting in the metal shop right now of our uh, Staten Island location, which is our original location. Um, and we also um, have another location in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, which we've had open for about a year and a half now. So mm -hmm. that one's fairly new, um, but this is our original location. And um, Scott and I started the makerspace here. What is it now? Um, so at the end of this month will be eight years, eight years? I think that's right. Right? 2020. Well, we opened in 2013. Yes, whatever that right? is. <laughs> and we actually <laughs> opened math, uh, one year to the day after Hurricane Sandy uh, flooded our, our metal shop that we're actually hanging out in here. And uh, we've been, uh, I've actually been in this space uh, operating my metal uh, fabrication business for uh, about 18 years. And uh, it's pretty well fit out for uh, metalworking as a as a maker space. We have a lot of welders and torches and uh, heavy anvils and that sort of thing. Um, but we uh, sort of shrank the metal shop down and uh, added a wood shop to the space. We built our own four by eight CNC router uh, several years ago now, probably five years, six years ago. And uh, that machine gets a lot of use. We do all kinds of projects on that. Uh, but we rented the space next to us, which is a um, uh, was an empty, just a vacant warehouse, and uh, we built out studio spaces there. So currently we have 10, 11, 11 studio spaces, I think. And uh, you know that uh, is is sort of those the studio members actually have uh, keys to the space, they come in and they can work in that space anytime they want. They don't have keys to the actual, uh, industrial side, um, just concerns over insurance and people working in the shop by themselves, uh, unsupervised. So, uh, you know, but the, they can come in and work in their studios, work with their own tools, uh, that sort of thing at any time they want. Uh, we also have a radio station who is a studio member here in Staten Island. Uh, they are Maker Park Radio, and uh, their webpage is makerparkradio.nyc. They do all kinds of uh, amazing uh, music and talk radio and really anything that uh, you can think of. There's a show for it on Maker Park Radio. So that's pretty amazing. Um, we have a, a small video that we uh, put together this week um, that one of our instructors, Anna, put together and uh, so we've kind of, because it's a little later in the day and uh, we do have two locations. Uh, the space we're in here is a 6,000 square foot space with a uh, park across the street that we have taken over from the city, a vacant lot. And we've built out a park. We do classes there. We do uh, makerspace events, outdoor uh, sort of get togethers and, and parties and art events and uh, all kinds of things happen there. But uh, then we have our Brooklyn location, which is a uh, 20,000 square foot maker space. And uh, you know, that's a, a, a big, vast 
space, but we wanted to uh, sort of condense that into a quick video. So Anna put this together and we're gonna try and show this if we don't have any more technical difficulties and you know how to do this? I'm working on it. So we're okay. gonna, I'm gonna get the video <laughs> set up here and then we'll show that. And then if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to um, ask us. So, so we're actually gonna just sort of narrate through this. Wait up. Oh. Waiting up, holding Hold up. up, holding up. Share screen. I gotta share the screen. All right, I share my screen. There we go. Mm -hmm. I share that. Make it a little bigger. Um, All right. <clears throat> okay, so this is some footage of our uh, Staten Island location, obviously. Staten Island Makerspace. We do put our logo on pretty much everything. You can pause any time, maybe if you want. Talk over it. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I do have a thing for sunflowers. And uh, we make sure that we have lots of sunflowers in our park. We also, at our park, we have a... Um, we do a residency where folks can uh, come in and uh, they propose an idea and then they build out uh, their project over a couple months as uh, members. They come in, they learn tooling if they need to learn tools, and then they build their project and set it up outside. Uh, what we're looking at right here, uh, last weekend I held my first forging class in about eight weeks, or, I'm sorry, about eight months. And uh, it was a, a great couple. They came in and we went over uh, some basics around coal forging and we took railroad spikes and hammered those out to uh, make knives. And that's sort of our intro to blacksmithing class where we, uh, when we, uh, pre-COVID, we would have about six individuals. We set up two uh, anvils and we get together and make that, uh, make those uh, knives. And it's a great introductory class. And a lot of people are very excited about that. Uh, Cause you know, you don't get an opportunity to fire up a forge and actually uh, make a knife and take it home in the same day. Uh, certainly not in New York City. Uh, but I wanted to just pause there for a second because uh, our steam wagon there, uh, if you guys notice, we have a mobile maker space and uh, that is, uh, that's a former bread delivery truck that we converted into a mobile maker space. We would take that to schools. Currently that's uh, all on hold uh, as far as our outreach and, and STEM education. Um, but yesterday was actually our fifth anniversary, I don't know if you know this, of our first trip to a public school. And was it public school? It might have yeah, been a, yeah. 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 And um, yeah, it was our, our first trip. So that's, that truck has uh, been driving around teaching kids for about five years now, uh, which is a, a lot of fun. So there's some, uh, there's the footage of our Maker Park radio. That's actually the studio. So fairly tight quarters, but they do, they can fit a couple DJs. They do some live performances out of there as well. And that's uh, some pictures of the studio side. So our studio members range in from artists, uh, entrepreneurs, people that have started businesses. Some, many people have uh, started businesses and moved on. Um, we have a vintage typewriter repair uh, specialist and salesman that is in the makerspace as a studio member. And uh, he does some amazing things with and re restores these beautiful vintage typewriters.
Typewriters, yay. So in Staten Island, a unique space is the ceramic studio. Uh, so that used to be our uh, sewing room. And about a year and a half ago, when we fired up Brooklyn and, and started uh, setting that up, uh, the Brooklyn space has a wonderful sewing studio. And we didn't want to compete with ourselves, but we wanted to keep, uh, you know, have a unique draw to Staten Island. So the ceramic space uh, has been uh, really a wonderful space. We do outdoor raccoon firing and things like that as well in the park. Yep, we touched on that. I think you stepped up, stepped away for a minute. Now you would guys, don't take offense to that. You know, wood is the beginner's metal, but we say it jokingly. So this is our router in Staten Island at our Staten Island location. So four by eight capacity. And uh, we dressed her up since we built that machine, we dressed her up and put some disco lights on it. So uh, when we show off this machine to school groups, they get a big kick out of the lighting. an overview of the welding shop, right? Big weld sign that we have on the wall. the makerspace. Uh, it is my specialty. I've been doing it for uh, probably about 30 some odd years now and really very passionate about it. Uh, I love sharing the knowledge around it. It's a very uh, empowering experience because you're, you're physically modifying something in a permanent fashion. So, you know, that when you make a weld, it's multiple times harder than the base material that you're working with. And when you start seeing people understand those concepts and then creating things and objects and furniture and really anything you can imagine, when people really get into it, uh, it's an extremely rewarding process. Uh, so I, th I honestly think everybody should weld. or at least learn how to weld. You might not, not have to do it for a living, but it is a lot of fun to be able to do it. So that process right there, that's TIG welding. Uh, the first one where there were a lot more sparks, that was actually MIG welding. And MIG stands for mechanical or inert gas welding. And TIG stands for tungsten inert gas welding. So really sort of recommend that if you 
are interested in welding, start with MIG welding and then work your way up. And that's a oxyacetylene torch. And what's coming up here, this is actually something we do with school groups. Um, what well, we're going to show you here in just a second. Uh, so one of the things that we do is work with our local schools, our lo local public schools. They'll come down and get a tour of the space. And we talk about the machinery and uh, 3D printing and laser cutting and the CNC uh, router. And, you know, we try and tie that into what they're working on in school. And then uh, we'll do some demonstrations of other things. But one of the things we do is we fire up the oxyacetylene torch and take a, a piece of material similar to this square bar and we'll heat it up red hot and talk about the physics behind it and the process of the molecules accelerating and the gases involved that are, are heating it up and we'll twist this here in a second and you know then we throw it in a bucket of water and they get a they get to touch it they get to see this material be modified uh, right in front of their eyes and after it goes in the water literally five seconds later all the heat has been sucked out of it and they can touch it with their bare hands where it was a couple thousand degrees just a few seconds before so it's really fascinating to, to uh, sort of you know brighten their eyes and, and get kids to understand that the world around them still needs to be made plus they get really excited about fire yeah yeah fire well much like myself I'm super excited watching this. <laughs> And, you know, one of the things that we can't really do with kids is show them the, the welding, right? Because it's a super bright light, it's dangerous for their eyes, it's super hot uh, material. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we can do is show welding and actually do it live in person, similar to what we're doing with a Zoom call here. You know, they, they, can, they can sort of get a better view of that. So this is the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Uh, the Army Terminal was built in 1918. It is a three and a half million square foot facility. It's a big giant warehouse. It's fascinating. And we've worked in partnership with New York City Economic Development Corporation to open up the space at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. It's actually a FutureWorks makerspace at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, and it's, it's a very well fit out space. It's very organized. It is a bit cleaner, a little less character than our Staten Island location. It's getting broken in. It's getting broken in. Yeah, it's, it's starting to get some scrapes and some, some bumps and some dust, sawdust developing. Uh, but between the two spaces, we have a huge assortment of equipment. Uh, we have six or seven laser cutters. Uh, we have three four axis CNC milling machines. We have four bridge, bridge port style milling machines, uh, three wood lathes, four metal lathes, uh, two saw stops. Um, you know, so this is the machine shop, a couple, a couple of our lathes and some Tormox there. We went to the wood shop. The wood shop gets in heavy use. Working. Yeah. Yeah, we've got quite a few members that just only work in the wood shop. 
We also have a four by eight shop bot there as well as a desktop for our CNC woodworking uh, needs. but since COVID, we haven't been able to do group classes. So we do one-on-one -on -one classes right now or like small small groups. Like this is a, a, a couple. I think there, I think. there were a couple. Yeah. Um, so we'll train people on the, on the equipment. Right, because we still have to get people up to speed with the equipment and the safety and use on all of that. Vacuum former. So this is a shot of the sewing area and soap screening, heat press, uh, 10 color embroidery machine, which is a really amazing machine. So a uh, small leather working bench as well as jewelry. And uh, that's a shot of the welding department in uh, Brooklyn. So we have an iron worker, a four by four flow water jet. So that machine is capable of cutting up to eight inch thick material, uh, any material that you would like. Back there is our 3D printing area and electronics bench. So we have three Ultimakers, two Prusas, multiple maker bots. Uh, oh, this is a great Mark interview with Jim Freeman. Means that theater people and publishing people can come to me and say, We have a particular baking problem to solve. This started when Scott reopened the maker space uh, a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, and I just went around to some folks that I know, uh, especially the publishing community, and said, Is there anything I can do for you? And my overall objective was to share as many. 21st century manufacturing techniques with the public community as possible. One of the aspects of puppetry is that we want to keep it alive. We want to make it easy for new artists to join. And making it easy for new artists to join, part of that is reducing the drudgery to get started, reducing the, the hand work, and, and letting the creative process flow as freely as possible to the objects, the puppets, the scenery, the costumes, all the rest of it. I wanted to see if I could find an easier way for the puppet maker to carry on his craft. Now, traditionally, the way a marionette maker or a puppet maker carries on their craft is they make a plasticine model, they can make it a mold of that, then they fill it in that negative mold with plastic wood or some other kind of casting material. And there are lots of places where that process can fail. You get bubbles in the, in the mold process. Um, the plastic wood can dry too quickly and not and crack or stick to the mold. And fundamentally, the puppet itself becomes too valuable. What you want really is for the, the sculpture in the puppeteer's head to be the most important thing. You want the actual realization of it to be almost disposable because it's going to go on stage. It's going to be subject to stress. It's going to be subject to accidents. So what we'd like to do is be able to make these puppets on demand. We'd also like to get to the point where you tweak them a little, make one, oh, that's not quite right, let's try again. So I began doing 3D printing for puppeteers. And I began with my friend Nick Coppola at Public Works, showed him what I could do. And he handed me a puppet head and said, Jim, can you copy this? And I thought about it for a moment. I said, yes, yeah, sure. This is actually a copy of that very head. And you can see um, that it's actually made off a scan, a 360-degree scan in a turntable, uh, which I made uh, a little over 380 photographs, a little under one degree, put it through Regard 3D, which is a 3D modeling package, produced a 3D model, cleaned it up in Mesh Mixer, which is yet another 3D modeling package, and finally put it on the 3D printer here. And lo and behold, we had a puppet head. Um, went on to another progressive problem, uh, his production of Alice in Wonderland. 
Uh, I'm not going to tell you a secret. Don't tell the children. Alice in Wonderland are actually three puppets. There's the normal Alice, and then when she shrinks, there's a little tiny Alice. And when she grows to a giant, there's a third Alice, a giant Alice. Well, the tiny Alice and the giant Alice never really batch in their puppets. So my next project for Nick was to scan a the normal Alice, which was okay, and then shrink Alice and expand Alice, what I call the tale of three Alice. So we really expanded as many ways as we can think of about expanding uh, the graphic puppetry. A lot of 3D printing, a lot of laser cutting of body parts, a lot of precision metal for some of the button parts inside the puppet that used to be made out of uh, something called trunk fiber, which is a, a primitive plastic bale system. The metal parts do not. Um, I also have a modest practice making props. Um, I happen to be a member of the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, a theater company running over well over 30, 40 years in, in New York City, well over 40 years. Um, and one of the things I do to help them is make props, and that's in fact what I'm doing today. Interesting thing about props in the COVID world, since everybody's in their own Zoom envelope, performing from or from their apartment, you may not realize it, but if I want to pass, I would say, a, a prop, a crystal or a sword from one actor to another, well, each actor has to have their own identical copy of the prop. Well, that's fairly easy in a shop where I can make identical copies on a laser cutter and a 3D printer and use the tools of the wood shop to make duplicates. I actually learned about the makerspace because it was an ad of the New York City Ferry. And I was traveling on the ferry and it said, oh, Makerspace opening up. Oh, that sounds like me. I'll go there and see what they have to offer. And I just, I was blown away by this place. It's a wonderful community of folks. We help each other out. We share techniques. The place is kept very neat, very stable, very clean, very well supported. One of the nice things is that I don't need to possess a 3D printer to practice 3D printing. I don't need to possess my own metalworking tools to do metalworking. All right. There we are. We're All right. We're back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that uh, ending there, that was uh, Jim. I think the music was a little loud over the, the voice over there. So our apologies there. Uh, you know, we're doing what a lot of makerspaces do and flying by the seat of our pants trying to figure it out. Uh, but uh, I did want to share, Jim's doing a thing um, over the next, uh, he's doing something tomorrow and then uh, on the 24th, uh, doing a virtual puppet show. Uh, so check that out if you want. Actually, let me see if I can find the link. Yeah, for the what link it's... I can send you. But, um, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. I'm glad she included a little bit of our member, one of our members. Um, we've got an interesting um, mix of people, um, artists, people like Jim who are doing, um, sort of running their businesses out of the makerspace. Um, and we've got mm -hmm. everything from um, you know, artists to carpenters to metal workers. We've got um, in Brooklyn, there's a bio, big biotech community. And so we've got some people coming in and uh, 3D using the resin 3D printers mm -hmm. to, to um, print specialty lab equipment things. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of fashion designers. Yep. Um, and also just hobbyists and people that uh, have no idea, right? I mean, we're, I think we're really probably preaching to the choir. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're into the maker movement, uh, you, you get it, you know, what's going on. And uh, it's, it's an opportunity for you to uh, build whatever you want to build at a makerspace. And I think uh, really every community, every, every, city every town should have a community supported uh makerspace mm -hmm. you know and 
I mean, one of the things that we're, that like you don't get to see on the video or us talking um, is sort of the broader um, ways in which we interact with the community. Um, you know, we do a lot of um, school trips. So we work with schools. Um, so that's a big part of what we do. It's a big part of what we're lacking right now. And it's a challenge, um, you know, in different ways. Um, but, you know, like we do, we work with community groups. Um, Scott says he likes to teach everybody how to weld. One of the pro projects that we did last year, um, which I actually visited today because I was um, at an event elsewhere. But um, last year we built, a, we had the, the, the entire staff of the Staten Island Museum, um, which are all women, they came in and they were getting ready to do, uh, to mount uh, an, ex an exhibit in the museum um, about the women's suffrage movement and about the uh, anniversary um, of the women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. So one of the things on Staten Island is there's a story about a woman who flew the first flew a biplane around Staten Island and dropped voting uh, registration cards down from the sky yeah. in her little biplane. So like a hundred years ago. Uh, we, uh, we collaborated with the museum and they came here and the entire staff spent a couple of months almost yep. coming in um, on a regular basis, uh, building a, a biplane, a replica biplane, uh, which is now installed on the grounds of uh, Snug Harbor Cultural Center where the museum's located. Um, you know, so like that's an interesting way and, you know, something that we love to do is work with community, other community organizations and, uh, you know, collaborate in ways in which we can help them, they can help us, you know, like, um, you know, we're all about helping people uh, make stuff and, build things for the community. Oh. We had a uh, project called Sonic Gates uh, and we worked with uh, a jazz musician actually who was the curator and organizer of the uh, project with uh, and as we, also with our local arts council, Staten Island Arts here. And the idea was a series of sound sculptures that would be around uh, the North Shore of Staten Island and people could, could kind of walk from sculpture to sculpture and they can interact with them and they make music or uh, bells and that sort of thing. And we worked with, uh, I guess, a half dozen artists on the project. And then Debbie and I both got, had the opportunity to make a piece. Um, but it was, it was really uh, one of those fun things because people could come in uh, and we would teach them uh, the equipment to help them build their project. And these projects were uh, needed to be fairly robustly as they were going to be outside for a year. The lifespan of the project was a year uh, of people interacting with it and making music. And uh, one of our members, Jeremy, made this large sort of steel arch, kind of like this uh, St. Louis arch in this uh, thing. And had these big steel tubes that hung down and you could walk up and, and push the tubes and uh, they would clank and make music. Uh, another project actually was installed in the water off the North shore here. Uh, and it was a bunch of buoy, sort of lobster trap buoy, uh, pallet wood, an old Victrola, uh, some metal bits, some signage, some bells. And uh, as the, a sort of flotation device would rock back and forth uh, in the water. It would, it would make this really kind of crazy uh, musical sound from the water. Uh, but it was it was a great example of working with our uh, local arts council our, and local artists, uh, many of whom, well, I mean, they were from all over the city, but um, also, you know, working with our city officials and getting permits and working with parks and, uh, you know, you've got to kind of have a whole bunch of uh, people that come together for projects like that. And when you see that support and you see that those things come together, it's uh, very rewarding, you know. So what else we got? I don't know. 
I don't know if there are people, if anybody's watching, I don't know if anybody has any questions um, that we could answer. Forges are so cool. Yes. Forges are cool. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're hot, actually. <laughs> I think it's important if you're going to start a makerspace, if you're going to run a makerspace, it's important to keep a sense of humor, right? <laughs> and bad jokes. Is my sense of humor a bad joke? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is. Oh, hey, oh, hey Peter. Peter. Um, yeah, Peter from Fat Cat checking in. I think Peter's, I think Peter's coming up, up after us. Coming up next. Right? Um, and. We were, one of the things that we um, did this year during COVID, which probably a lot of you did, um, was we were able to jump in and help out making um, uh, PPE. We made face shields, um, but we collaborated with um, Fat Cat and with some other, and, and a lot of the other uh, makerspaces in the, in the city, trying to coordinate, like helping each other out, source materials and, and do things like that, so. Get things, drop them off. I, I remember, you know, we were all uh, very concerned about uh, the virus and spread. And I happened to uh, meet one of uh, Fat Cat Fab Labs volunteers at a uh, store that they opened up especially so that we could purchase the elastic for the face shields. And uh, we went in and we bought every piece of elastic that this uh, guy had at in the fashion district I, like we're going out with just garbage bags full of you know this all this elastic because there, we couldn't find anything to put it all in there wasn't enough boxes we just started loading up these garbage bags and we went down and uh, I told him I said look I you're, you're a great guy but I don't know you and I don't want you riding in my truck but I'll drop your stuff off at Fat Cat for you and I went down there and saw Peter and dropped off the, their elastic. And then Peter needed rubber. And I was like, well, that's great, but I don't want you riding in my truck. I'm like, are you cool riding in the back of my truck? And he hopped in the back of the truck and it was just dumping down rain. And uh, my truck has a little bit of a cap on it, but it certainly isn't uh, waterproof by any means. Uh, but drove Peter down to the... Uh, down to the rubber store on Canal Street. And, uh, you know, it's just, a, it was do, makers doing what makers do, right? Coming together uh, to solve a problem. And, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Check that. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Good times, Peter. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what else I have. Uh, if you, you know, anyone watching, if you don't have a local makerspace, start one. Uh, don't start one. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it, yeah, we're not, gonna, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna uh, beat up on owning a makerspace too bad, but uh, it is a lot of work but it is also very rewarding. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, you, you help people and you encourage people to make totally off the wall stuff or uh, life-saving stuff or, you know, ways that they can better their lives and uh, they can start their own businesses and they can even move into trades or, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's just nothing better than to say I made that. And, I think everybody should be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. If anybody is in New York City, want to come down and check out either one of our spaces, um, you're always welcome. Um, send us an email or give us a call. Yeah. Um, and we'll be happy to show you around. Um, and we're, we're thrilled to be a part of Maker Fair and hoping, fingers crossed, uh, we can all get together next year at uh, the World Maker Fair if they run it again this year yeah. and uh, yeah, you know, be great to see everybody in person again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it. So you guys uh, take care. Have a great night. Have a great night. Enjoy the rest of the night. Looking forward to seeing Peter here in a few minutes. Bye guys. <laughs>